Welcome to Resilient. I'm Lori Lorenzo, Deloitte's Research and Insights Director for our Chief Legal Officer Program and host of the Resilient Chief Legal Officer Track. What does it mean to be a values-based leader? And how do you help others to connect with your values? You tell stories about the moments that shaped you. In this episode, Sarah Alrahib Dagger, educator, leadership coach, and pedagogy specialist at Harvard Kennedy School, reflects on how storytelling taught her about the power of education, understanding others, and finding her voice. Sarah kicks off our Legal Influencer series, a sub-series of the resilient CLO track that focuses on leaders who have interesting and important skills and insights that CLOs can use to support their own professional journeys. As our first Legal Influencer guest, Sarah shares how legal executives can use storytelling as an effective tool to build relationships, motivate teams, and drive change. Let's hear what Sarah has to say. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you on today. Thanks, Lori. I'm so happy to be on with you. I'm really excited for today. So I want to just take a second and explain to our listeners the direction of today's podcast. It's going to be a little bit different than what we've been doing in that this is our first influencer episode. And I'm not using that word exactly the way our friends in social media might use it, but instead thinking about this wonderful leader in Sarah who has this distinct set of skills and experiences, in fact, some stories and maybe even some stories about magic that we'll talk about today that our typical audience, our legal listeners might find hopefully exciting, exhilarating, and helpful to their own journey in the legal profession. So Sarah, are you ready to jump in with me? I'm ready. And I'm so excited to be called an influencer. I thought I'd have to sell some weight loss tea or something to get to there. (laughs) If you need a partner on some uh, get rich quick scheme, you let me know. We'll go together. I'm really glad to know I have a partner in crime on that. Great. I will Uh, let you know. Okay. Well, Sarah, I like to start these podcasts, in fact, with stories. And my favorite stories are stories about uh, leaders who were young people and what the key influences in their early lives were. So will you take us back to uh, maybe elementary school, Sarah, or high school, Sarah, and what those experiences were, those defining moments, and maybe some of the people that have influenced your journey. Absolutely. I think about young Sarah a lot, actually, uh, partly because of the work I do with stories, but also because of, I think the way I lead today and the way that I teach today has so much to do with her (laughs) and who she was and the experiences she had. Since I was a really young kid, my grandmother, she was actually the the youngest of nine siblings in Egypt, growing up in Egypt. And she was the only one who was able to actually go get a post-secondary education. And she'd go to night school and her dad really supported her to do this. She became a teacher. And she would tell me stories of teaching in the English mission in Egypt all the time and staging plays or teaching English literature to her students and how much her students just adored her, you know, and you could tell, you could tell from the woman that she was, um, just that she put her students first and that they saw that, felt that, respected that. And I always really admired that. I was always like, wow, that's a superpower to be able to be with young people and be able to influence them and impact them and teach them, you know, and also to help them to see themselves more clearly as well. Yeah, I I think I read somewhere you describing your grandmother's influence or the emotion you had when she was teaching you as magic. So this ability she had to kind of help you learn and discover. Yes, yes. My grandma, she lived till she was 91 years old. And I'm very grateful that she got to meet my son, who, you know, he, now he's two and a half. She she knew him for about six months before she she passed on. And till the end of her life, she would sing these nursery rhymes and these songs. And, and every child in the room just looks up at her with absolute adoration, you know, and is so engaged by her. She just 
she could turn any room into a playground. She could turn any room into a learning environment, a magical learning environment where you could be someone different or where you could learn um, beautiful songs, beautiful music, stories. And I just thought that that was so powerful that she was able to create those spaces. She created them for me. You know, um, I'll tell you some stories in a little bit about growing up and some of the challenges that came with that. But in her space, in her presence, it was always safe and it was always magic. She just created joy. And I think she helped me to see myself in a different way. You know, just a massive, massive character and impact in my life. Well, I must say that I am certain beyond a doubt that your grandmother is so proud of you because I know when I experienced your teaching for the first time in this huge conference room full of women lawyers, I remember having that same reaction that this is just the most tremendous opportunity to learn a fantastic skill. So clearly uh, she passed it down to you and you're doing such a good job with that. Um, But let's, you know, you're welcome. Um, Before we get to the work you do today, I want to talk a little bit more about um, young Sarah. So you had this tremendous influence through your grandmother that inspired you to go into teaching. Um, What else would you say was formative in those early years as you were kind of deciding what path you would take uh, into adulthood? Yeah. You know, one of the earlier memories that I have, I was in fourth grade and um, I had developed a lot earlier than the rest of my classmates. And, you know, growing up as a young girl, you're already so self-conscious. But the fact that my curves were starting to spring up, it became a target on my back with my classmates. And I remember one specific day, um, it was a beautiful, beautiful sunny day. We were playing tetherball in the yard. I loved playing tetherball and um, this boy named Lawrence came up to me and he said, you know, Sarah, I'm going to, I'm going to grab your chest. And he said it in more, you know, vulgar words, but essentially I remember just feeling really afraid and uncomfortable and I was only 10, right? So I did what I think most 10 year olds would do. And I just started to run and I ran, I ran up the the grassy soccer field and I was just trying to get away from him. And as he was running after me, he was making motions with his hands, laughing. Um, And I just felt, I felt pretty afraid. So I I remember I ducked into the, the bathroom and later that day I went home and I was crying and I was just telling my mom about that whole situation. My mom is incredible. Um, She stayed home with us until we were, about 12 years old. Then she went back. She did two master's degrees. She's now like a very successful, incredible social worker um, that works in the school board here. But at the time, you know, she was so present to everything that, that we were going through. And I remember, you know, she always smelled like jasmine. That was her scent. And I remember kind of just snuggling into her and telling her what happened. And I said to her, you know, mom, I don't want this guy to get into trouble, but this is what happened. And after I told her, she said, okay, just leave it to me. I'm not going to get him into trouble, but this needs to be dealt with. So I said, okay. And I remember the next day I'm sitting in class and the teacher kind of stops everything and leads this whole discussion in my class about bodies and about how all bodies are different and all bodies are beautiful and how about we have to respect each other's bodies, respect each other's space, right? And I knew that that my mom was behind that conversation right? And I kind of mustered up the courage. I looked two rows behind me at Lawrence and he was kind of just staring down at his desk. And I knew he knew why that conversation was happening as well. Later that day at recess, again, he kind of came up to me and, you know, he tapped me on my shoulder, you know, Sarah, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do that again. And he ran away from me. And that kind of memory is one of my earliest memories of, oh, this is why education matters. The way my mom dealt with it was not to like go get the kid in trouble, right? But it was about to, it was about education. Like, let's have a conversation about this. Let's educate um, each other about what it means to respect each other's space, right? And I thought that that was, I was so proud of that, especially looking back on it as an adult, that she handled it that way. And it taught me a lot about the power of education, not to only transform your own circumstances, right? But the circumstances of those around you. And, and that kid never bothered me again. In fact, we became, we became friends later. 
So yeah, that was one of the special moments that I can remember about what makes education so powerful. Wow. Um, so I'm seeing you as you're growing and um, exploring the world around you with other young people. And you have this wonderful influence through your grandmother who's teaching and your mom who you described as present. And I just have to say, as a mom myself, that is so hard to do, right? Yeah. We want to, but it's so hard. And the, between the two of them giving you the confidence, A, to come home and share the story, and then the trust that your mom would handle that in a way that was healthy for everyone. I mean, yeah. what a beautiful foundation to your life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there were a lot of challenges outside of my home, but what I'm so kind of grateful for is the, the strength that I had in my family. You know, my mom, my grandma, my grandfather, my dad, my siblings, they really were the kind of bedrock and my foundation. And when things were hard on the outside, I always knew that I had a soft place to land on the inside. And also I'm a mom. And Lori, I remember in a different podcast, you were saying you're a mom of six, which like, six. oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> like, <laughs> we have to talk offline after this because I can't, I can't believe that. That's wonderful. Um, yeah. But as a mom now, I'm just like, okay, that's something that I really want to strive for is that when, you know, my son comes home, it's a safe place to land and, and somewhere that he feels um, empowered to really be himself. And so as you continue to grow and uh, walk your path through middle school and high school, how did this love for teaching and desire to replicate the magic of your mom yeah. and your grandma and the support of your, your father and your brothers, how did that come out in middle school and high school? What kinds of things were you doing? I went to a really tiny private Christian high school. My whole graduating class was 50 people. So you can imagine, right, that socially um, you had to really be on top of things to make sure that you would have an easier go of it, right? That you can't really blend into the background in a school like that. And so kind of my decision going into high school was, okay, there are hard things. My sort of physical self was one of my biggest challenges. I was always a bit bigger than everybody else. I looked different than everybody else. And so I kind of had to navigate, how am I going to define who I am, right? Um, and I remember there was one specific moment in high school, I was kind of just sitting on my bed crying, and my dad came into my room um, with his, you know, slightly tinted eyeglasses. I don't know why that was a thing, but there are all these tinted, <laughs> regular seeing eyeglasses. He came in, and he had his regular coffee breath and his thick Egyptian accent, and he asked me, you know, what's wrong? And I told him, you know, dad... I'm just not happy. I'm not happy. And he told me something in that moment that I'll never forget. And in fact, is kind of my, my North Star even today. He said, instead of searching for happiness, search for peace. And in that moment, he handed me this notebook, this blue notebook with silver lettering on the front said engineering composition book. And he said, every time you start to feel this way about yourself, instead of feeling sorry for yourself, I want you to just try to write about it. And that became the tool for me that helped me to find my way, my voice, my leadership all throughout middle school and high school. It was writing, right? Because I'd experienced something challenging and I'd write like a really bad poem about it, right? And I'd share it with my family and they'd be like, wow, this poem is amazing, you know? <laughs> or I'd write like a little skit. And I think those were the beginnings of me trying to find my identity and find my voice was kind of negotiating the hurt through creative means. And that's kind of the leadership I took in high school. Then I became really involved in theater, um, first acting, but then where I really found my stride was directing and stage managing and, and those sort of behind the scenes roles that helped me to find who I was in a creative way and be able to express myself in a creative way. Um, I remember actually as well in the third grade, there was this, this social worker who came to our school and every, every class got one sort of representative chosen. And I was in the third grade and they had chosen me to be this representative for this leadership program that this social worker was leading. And I remember the kind of definition that she was giving us about what it meant to be a leader was to, to have the answers, right? To be fiercely independent. And so that's kind of how I was operating in the beginning, right? Was, okay, to be a leader, I have to know the answers. I have to be in charge. 
But what I learned throughout high school and especially with theater is that no, leadership is about being interdependent. It's about being able to bring people along with you and cultivate other people's leadership with you. And that's really what theater teaches you is like everybody has a function. And in order for something to succeed and in order for you to be a leader within that, you need to be able to rely and grow the people around you as well. Well, we have to stop on this point, right, and spend a little bit of time here because I think that that social worker's definition of leadership maybe aligns with the way some lawyers may see their role, right? Mm -hmm. I have Mm -hmm. to know what the answer is. I have to have a very strong opinion and self of, sense of self. That's why people pay me to have these, to know things and have opinions. And contrasting that with what you said about actual leaders is giving other people the opportunity to shine and uh, to, to come up with their own answers. And thinking about what you do now, which is storytelling and teaching storytelling and how that intersects with the, the skill set of a lawyer. And I think, you know, one of the things we're seeing in the data about the legal profession is that there is a a need, an interest, a desire to grow the skills, I call it all the skills you didn't learn in law school, right? So not the ability to litigate a case, not the ability to write a contract, uh, but the ability to lead teams, the ability to bridge difference, the ability to empower others. This is what you're talking about here, right? Evolving the definition of leadership to do those things. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer, you know, but the skills that I've learned in kind of the leadership work I've been doing around what you're talking about around growing teams, building relationships, right? It really is the foundation for any healthy workplace, right? And I think story is one of the most powerful, authentic tools that you can use to build the foundations of healthy teams and to build the foundations of healthy relationships. Why? Because story, you know, a lot of time we get told, like, check your emotions at the door, right? Emotions don't belong here. And it's such a shame because emotions are one of our primary drivers, right? And when you think about um, anything, any kind of emotion, like even anger, right, which sometimes gets a bad reputation. Oh, anger, don't be angry. Well, actually, anger can be one of the best motivators if it's channeled towards good, right? And I'm not talking about blind rage, right? But outrage that something is not right, something is not okay. So how do we come together to change that? And story, it's obviously an incredible tool to bring out emotion in others, right? Even when we're talking right now, you're you're empathizing and you're saying, oh yeah, I'm a mom too. The thing about presence, it's through those stories that we're able to make those real connections for ourselves about, oh, this made me angry. This made me hopeful. Well, what does that then mean about what you value? And once you're able to really articulate what you value, then you can find others who share those values. And when you find those who share your values, especially in the workplace, that's when real change can come about because you're connecting on something a lot deeper than just issues or tasks. You're connecting on something that's foundational to who you are. And through there, you're building relationships that can weather the storms that will come in the work that you do. Yeah, I love what you said about using emotions to your advantage, because I think it is true, maybe especially for women, but I think for everyone in corporate America, that there is some maybe unspoken rule that says you, there, emotions don't belong here. So I went through a, a really challenging work situation. And I was so upset by what had happened. I was bringing that negative emotion to the workplace, but without having kind of a focus for it or a context or Mm -hmm. a a way to use it. And I finally said, I need to do something. I took an improv acting class. And in much the same way that you're talking about, learning how to craft that emotion into a goal, into a challenge, into the opportunity to build something better, allowed me to use what I was feeling in a positive way. So tell me how you teach people to build and craft and deliver effective stories. Yeah. So the craft that I teach right now is it's called public narrative. It's actually a craft that was developed by this professor at Harvard Kennedy School called Marshall Gantz. He's a good friend, a mentor, a teacher, and and a collaborator for the last decade that I've been working with. And 
the the sort of practice of public narrative that he has built um, alongside hundreds of students and teaching fellows is around storytelling for social political change, right? And so it's not just storytelling for the sake of telling a nice story. It's storytelling for the purpose of changing something, of getting something done. And so public narrative, it's all about sort of these three components, right? There's a story of self, which is who am I and what are the moments in my life as a leader that have brought me to my calling? And not necessarily to your job, because sometimes job and calling don't necessarily um, align. If we're lucky, they do. But sometimes we take a job to pay the bills. But if we are working a job that really is our calling, we're thinking about how do I articulate the moments in my life, just like what you're asking me, Lori, those early moments that led me to the calling that I carry today. And that story of self-peace, the idea of it is, you know, as a leader, I want to share with you not only the challenges that I've been through, but also the sources of hope that I've encountered in my life that have brought me to where I am. There's so many moments where people go into communities, go into rooms, and they start, here's the plan, right? Or, hi, I'm here to fix this. And, and the first question is, well, who the heck are you, right? Who are you to come in here and try to change this, that, or the other? And the story of self is a really effective tool to be able to say authentically and genuinely, here are the moments in my life that were tough, but also here were the moments in my life that were really incredible. And here's how they led me to make the choices that I made that bring me to where I am today. And that's why I'm in this room with you right now. Yeah, as I think about how this relates to leaders in the legal profession, um, it's not just for the purpose of social change. Although lawyers can, and it's my own opinion, I think we should be at the forefront of social justice and, and change. Right. This is also helpful in, in much smaller moments, right? So as the role of the chief legal officer, the legal executive expands and the purview of what folks are responsible for changes and evolves, we have to be able to get to know new and different people on a personal level so we can build trust, so yes. we can develop relationships, so we can align on what you said earlier, the values, so we can agree that we're, we're moving in the same direction. There's nothing more powerful than being real. Just to say it in very simple terms, when somebody can see you as a real person and not just as their lawyer, right, or their boss, but they see you as a real person with emotions, with experiences, how much more conducive is that to building authentic relationships that can weather the storms, really? Because that's what that's about, is if I can tell you a story that helps you to understand who I am, my motivations and why I care, then maybe you're going to link into that and understand um, the kind of person I am that you'll be working with, right? Or that you'll be learning from or whatever it is in that specific context. Yeah. So the first step, if, if you're thinking about how to craft an effective story, is to connect with those early foundational experiences that define who you are and your values. Exactly right. You know, in comic books or superhero stories, there's always that origin story. You're trying to find out how that person got their superpower, right? And the story of self is very similar because you're going back to those origins, those early moments, because that's when we learn our values. I don't learn my values when I'm 35. I learn my values when I'm seven. Importantly, through the stories that my parents share with me or that my grandparents share with me or my teachers share with me, right? I'm learning what I value based on the emotions I feel when I'm hearing these stories that lead me to understand oh, this is unjust, or this is unfair. This is how I feel about this. So that means that this is what I value. And so we start in those early moments because that was really sort of the bedrock of who we are and of what brings us to where we are today. Mm -hmm. I just want to pause because I can imagine there might be some people listening that are saying, you know, I, I, I don't want to share that story. I don't yeah. want to talk about that. Uh, do you get that reaction when you're teaching? And how do you help people navigate through that? Uh, I think it's fear of sharing yeah. in that way. Yeah, I think what you said is exactly right. I think a lot of times it is fear, right? But there are two kind of different scenarios here. There's a scenario where someone says, I don't want to share that. And I'll hear what they're, what they what the story is. And I'll say, yeah, I agree with you. You shouldn't share that. Why is that? We talk about the difference between scars and wounds. A wound is, it's still open, it's still bleeding, it's not healed. 
sharing those wounds publicly, that's very, very challenging, right? Something that you still have not negotiated, you still have not um, sort of come to peace with. I don't think that public narrative or story is really the place to share that, right? Because what you're trying to express in, in your story is how you overcame. And if it's something that you have not overcome yet, then that's not necessarily an appropriate place to then share that story, right? It might be shared on a personal level, but again, it is called public narrative. So it needs to be something that you'd be comfortable sharing publicly. But at the same time, there are folks, just like you said, that it might just be fear that's holding them back, right? So for example, you want me to go in front of a room of my colleagues and share X? What are you talking about, right? And I'll ask, well, is it something that you are at peace with? Is it something that you've come to terms with? Is it really a reason why you've come to your calling? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, then what's holding you back from sharing it, right? And I think it's taking the time to really see the difference between those because there are absolutely stories that are not appropriate for a public venue. Mm -hmm. But there are stories that you have lived in your life that certainly are and that really help people to see and understand who you are, what you stand for, and what you value. Yeah, and that piece about um, connecting the why am I here, I think is really important. And for me, on my journey, professional journey so far, when I moved from the world of nonprofit to corporate America coming into Deloitte, one of the biggest challenges I had was understanding really at the core what the, the mission of this big firm was. And once I really understood how valuable the work that Deloitte is to uh, our clients and the public, I was able to say, okay, now I understand how I fit in this plan. And now mm -hmm. I can wake up and feel inspired to bring my best self, my, my biggest ideas to the workplace. And it's so important that I share that with my team so they can wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to bring my best into this workplace. Yeah. So being able to connect the story to that purpose, uh, so, so important. Lori, how did you come to that sort of fitting yourself within the broader mission? The, yeah. So when I started at Deloitte a little over five years ago, like I said, I came from this teeny tiny nonprofit. Uh, in the nonprofit world, mission is very clear. And in the world of small nonprofits, at least in mine, my mandate was do anything you want that advances the mission. And so for a creative person like me, that was the most amazing job ever. I could do any creative thing as long as it aligned with mission and fit in the budget. And when I came over to Deloitte, uh, although this is a very reputable firm with a wonderful um, brand, it, it wasn't a nonprofit, and I was really struggling to understand how I brought that um, energy to help people and advance mission into this corporate environment. And I, I was mentioning this to a partner who had been with the firm for decades at a cocktail reception one night, and he said, Lori, uh, here's one thing that may help you understand the value of the firm. Our audit practice ensures that companies are conducting their business in accordance with the highest ethical standards. Mm -hmm. And by doing what we do, the public that invests in these companies, that rely on these companies, that uh, choose to trust the products and services of these companies can have faith in what they're relying on, investing in. And for me, that was what I needed to hear, right? Deloitte does a lot of things, but at the core of what we do is we help to inspire trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's important to me. So that's how I align my work to what this firm does. I love that. I love sort of that moment at that cocktail party and what that meant to you sort of aligning with the values that you were hearing. And, and it's exactly something like that where it's like, okay, where you came to was trust that that was a really important value for you, right? And mm -hmm. if, if I were to say, okay, now tell me a story about where you learned that value, you could then take that reverse engineer and think about, well, when, yeah, when did that become important for me in my life? When did I not experience that kind of trust? But also when did I experience it? And how am I now living that out in my calling day to day in my work? And so it's those values that we learn. Those are the things that are really important for us to be able to communicate. Where did you learn them? What happened? 
When was it challenged, but when was it affirmed? And how can you tell that story in such a way that helps people to understand why you're there, why you care? And just like that, um, that, that gentleman that you're talking about, just like he did for you, hey, well, let me share a little bit about what this is and see if that's something that you connect with, which you did, which is really cool. Yeah. And one of the things I appreciated about how he framed it is it was so simple. So talk to me a little bit about how we create stories with that element of simplicity. Because I think if we're not careful, a story can go on and on and on and we get lost in the story and miss the point. Yes. You know, the sort of unit that we focus in on is the, the unit of the moment, a story moment. And when we're teaching this stuff, if it's in a workshop or in a course, we have people sort of start with two minutes, just two minutes. And anybody who's listening now can practice this. In two minutes, go back to the early moments in your life, share one specific vivid moment where you were facing some sort of challenge, one specific visual moment where you experienced hope. And then one specific visual moment where you made a choice that ultimately led you to your calling today. And we give people that time frame of two minutes because we've learned a couple things. One, that it's possible. It's possible to share all that within the span of two minutes. Two, it really um, challenges people to focus on painting visual pictures with their words and trusting that that gives the context that you would need to give. So I'll give you an example. A lot of times before we tell a story, we say, well, for you to get this story, I have to tell you this, 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 right? And we spend like 20 minutes giving context before we even get to the story. What I've seen time and time again is if you just dive into a specific visual moment right from the get-go, it will tell you everything you need to know about the context that you think you need to share, right? So even in our conversation that we had right now, we started off by saying, you asked me, Sarah, what was a moment where education was important to you, where your leadership uh, became important to you? And I told you a specific moment with me and that boy, Lawrence, and my mom, right? And I just dove right into the moment. I didn't say, well, you need to understand where I grew up and what happened and this and that. No, I just went right into the moment, told you what happened. And from there, you were able to then derive, oh, this is what this means. Here's the meaning of that moment. And so part of the art of storytelling is thinking about how do I paint visual moments of challenge, of hurt, of choice that bring me to where I am today? And how do I communicate those in such a way that it's accessible and it's also concise? And so the challenge that I put to anybody listening to this is practice this, try it, take two minutes and think about how do I share a specific moment of challenge, a specific moment of uh, hope, a specific moment of choice that brings me to where I am today. You'll surprise yourself that a lot of meaning can get transmitted with very little time and very specific focus on those visual moments. And I love the challenge of two minutes because sometimes when we are nervous, we can talk and talk and talk. And lawyers get a bad reputation for this. We uh, can be wordy. So having this two-minute cutoff where we we identify what we want to say and say it concisely, uh, I love it so much. And the truth is we don't always have a stage, a microphone, and a spotlight for a 60-minute right. keynote. Right. Sometimes we have to be able to tell a story and build that connection in an elevator or before exactly. the meeting starts. So two yes. minutes is fabulous. It's also such a beautiful way to build trust quickly, right? I think about my husband. My husband is amazing. He's a a chiropractor. He's a strength and conditioning coach. So the work he does, you need to build trust quickly, right? Because you're about to take somebody's health into your hands. And I've seen him time and time again just share like 30 seconds of a moment in his own life, something personal, something that he's gone through, right? And you just see the person in front of him, whew, exhale and let their guard down. It's amazing that with 30 seconds, with two minutes, you can do so much to build the kind of relationships and trust that you want to be foundational in the work that you do. 
Yeah, I, I love that story because uh, for me, working with strength and conditioning coach can sometimes be anxiety inducing, right? Because I've gone through phases in my life where I've been more fit and less fit. Yes. So sometimes approaching fitness is stressful and other times it's exhilarating. And so having someone that can just say, hey, I'm, I'm here for you. Here's a little story. And we form that connection of trust so we can move past kind of the awkwardness of beginnings. Let me ask you this. Have you seen in the workshops where you work with executives any tips or tricks for people that are still reluctant when you say, hey, it's just two minutes, pick something that you're comfortable with that inspires you, any tips for getting started for your most reluctant learners? <laughs> yes, that's, that's a great question. It happens a lot. It's scary, you know? Um, you're being asked in front of a room of your colleagues to share something that's meaningful, right? And that's personal. I think one of the most important sort of elements of the work that I do is around coaching. It's just having a conversation just like we're talking about right now. And you'll remember even in that, that room that we were in together, I started off by just asking some questions. Well, what does matter to you? What are your values? What's the key driver in your life right now? Oh, okay, where did that begin, right? And with the most reluctant folks, sometimes you have to start with, well, where did you grow up? Were you the oldest of your siblings? You know, getting people just comfortable with, oh, this idea of going back there to begin with. Because a lot of us like to leave our childhood where it is, right? Childhood is so awkward. There are so many difficult things that we experience in childhood. So sometimes we like to leave it there. But it really is the art of coaching. And I think especially in the legal profession, you're asking questions all the time. And it's meaningful question asking around, well, why did that matter so much to you? Where did that come from? Right? And the, the layers of why underneath it, to help that person slowly start to make those realizations for themselves. Because I think part of the reluctance is also, well, I don't know where that came from. I just always was that way. Right? I can't tell you how many rooms I've been in where I say, well, why do you care about equity? I don't know. I just, I was born that way. No, you weren't. You weren't born with a protest sign in your hand. Like equity became important to you at some point in your life. Right. And so how can we come back to those moments where it began to matter? And so the reluctance starts to sort of melt away once you start, oh, well, where did that happen? What happened then? What was the next moment? Right. What did that look like? What did you feel like? And helping that person recall for themselves those early moments, I think then builds the courage to, oh, yeah, that is where that started. I can't believe it. I haven't thought about that moment in years, but I was seven years old. I was sitting at my kitchen table. This is what happened. And once they start to make those connections for themselves, then they start to become more comfortable with the idea of then sharing that publicly. It takes a lot of careful and loving patience in asking questions to help sort of open up the memories uh, back then that really helped you to become who you are today. I'm really glad you used equity as an example because I have a mentor named Wharton Bellamy. And one of the things he said that sticks with me to this day was you can't be diverse and mysterious. If you're mm. the only person in a room that represents a particular group or looks the way you do, you're at a disadvantage and you have to take the initiative to create opportunities for likeness. Now, people may disagree with this particular advice of his, but I think it, as it relates to what you're saying in storytelling, for someone, um, sometimes I am one of only a few women in a room. Uh, right. I have been in rooms where I'm the only woman and it does feel even more scary to say I have six kids because how could I possibly be committed to work with all of these children running around, right? So right. it feels much more vulnerable to be yeah. the only and share a story that seems to put a spotlight on my onlyness. Uh right. What do you say to folks that are in that situation or is there any particular or different advice for, for people that are feeling singled out for any reason and, and sharing stories through those moments? It's such a complex issue, I think, because I can understand people who are like, well, I don't want to be the one who has to always put myself out there and explain who I am, right? I get that too, right? Where it's like, I, maybe I do want to be mysterious. Maybe I don't want the burden of having to share 
who I am, right, to this group of people who are so different from me. But I kind of love what he's saying because, and I think um, when it comes to difference and being the only, I think there is so much opportunity, right? And I guess this is the educator in me again, right? But to educate, right? To say, well, yeah, I do have six kids, but guess what? Look how amazing I am at my job, right? Or, you know, I grew up, um, again, in the theater world, and I did my undergraduate degree. I was the only person of color um, in the entire theater department, right? And, of course, I always got cast as these different roles, um, like the, the maid or the grandmother, right? I never got, like, a main role. And so I began to write plays myself. I began to be the one writing the play. And I wrote characters who were people of color, and I wrote characters who the main character was a person of color, right? And I was telling those stories through these characters as a way to sort of say, hey, uh, it's important for my perspective or my voice or my experience to be represented accurately here. Because if I don't tell my own story, someone else is going to tell it for me. Guaranteed, right? We walk into any room, people look at us, they already have their preconceived notions of us. If I don't reclaim that and share who I am from my perspective, my words and my experience, then I can guarantee that others will do that for me. Do I want to give that power up? No, I don't. And so while I think it's a very layered issue and there are a lot of nuances to it, to me, what I've experienced in my life is when I'm the one standing up and saying, this is who I am, this is why I care, right? It's very difficult for people to then assign um, their own version of their story of who I am to me, because I've already claimed it. Does that make sense? So much sense. And I love this part of how you teach storytelling. We craft the story that defines us. We don't right. give that power to anyone else. And listen, people will make up stories for stuff they don't know, right? In the absence of information, I think the human brain is wired to make up a story that makes sense to us. And so we have the power to put the story out there that is the story we want told about ourselves. Yes. And storytelling is the opportunity to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I could not have said that better myself. You know, right now I'm taking this playwriting course at Juilliard just for fun. I just need a little bit of a, you know, some a creative inspiration in my life. So I'm taking this class and there was this quote I read the other day where uh, it, it's Rita Mae Brown. She says, character's destiny, change growing from within and force from without is the mainspring of character development. And when I'm thinking about that in writing the characters that I'm writing, it makes a lot of sense. But when I think about it in the context of storytelling about myself, it also makes a lot of sense, right? Because it's who that who I say I am that is my destiny, not what somebody else assigns to me as a woman, as a woman of color, as whatever it is, that label, right, that people put upon us. And I just want to point this out because I don't think we said it earlier. You teach storytelling at Harvard, right? This is not for uh, just theater majors at Juilliard or anywhere else. This is not just for high school kids that are trying to figure out who they are. This is a real world executive skill that Harvard is investing in and growing and teaching to its students, right? Yes, exactly. At Harvard, there's there's a fall course, which is this public narrative course. You go way into depth on stories, um, application, and, and being able to build your own. And then in the spring, we, we teach this organizing course, which then takes storytelling as a tool for the organizing that we want to do in the world to make the change that we want to make. And one of my favorite groups that I get to work with every year, I feel very lucky to do this. This is through Harvard as well, is I get to work with 40 mayors every single year. This is one of the most rewarding groups of people to work with because you see them immediately implement these storytelling skills in their day-to-day -day life. How? So every year we go through this six-week program with them where I'm teaching them uh, public narrative with a crew of coaches also supporting this work. And they're incredible, very, very talented coaches. And what you see the next day, you turn on the news and a mayor's on the news sharing a story instead of telling a statistic, right? And it makes such a profound difference because people just kind of start to tune out when you're when you're just uh, naming numbers or like here are the number of people that are impacted. But it's very different to then say, here's a person in a community and let me tell you the story of that person. 
-hmm. It motivates action so much more effectively when there's a person and a story behind a statistic. And so it's interesting because we work with a whole breadth of people, right? We work with obviously graduate students and undergraduates, but we also get to work with people who are doing incredible work in the world, mayors and doctors and teachers and lawyers. There's actually an amazing um, narrative program through the law school that uh, Marshall is running right now as well, where it's this tool of storytelling, this craft that you can apply in so many different ways, whether you're being interviewed as a mayor on a television or whether as a lawyer, you're working with um, with a client who let's say you're defending, how do you tell the story of that client, right? And, and help the, the judge and the jury to see that person as a full person with a full life, right? How do you tell those stories in an effective way and in a way that helps people to understand the broader picture of what you're trying to communicate around the values that you're trying to transmit? I love that. I love that you're working with mayors to help them serve their communities in a more effective way. Um, that's work you can wake up for every day. I want to summarize some of the tips that you've given us so far. So when we're thinking about how to craft impactful stories for the purpose of building trust in our organizations with our colleagues and others, um, some of the things you've said so far, one, to think about your values and the moments that influenced or shaped those values. Two, to just jump into a story instead of explaining, you know, all the background and the who and the what and the why, just jump right in. Three, to try to stay concise. And then was there, did I hear a fourth about um, connecting the story to what you're trying to accomplish or am I making that yes. up? No, you're not making that up at all. We really dug into the self piece, right? Like who am I and why do I care? We really focused on that. But the other two elements of this craft are the story of us which is who are we as a community? If you're in a room full of people, the story of us is a really powerful tool to help people to feel connected to each other. So the story of us is really about what have we as a community, as a room, as a staff, as a whatever, right? What have we already overcome together? Where do we find hope in one another? And telling the stories of those shared experiences that you have that show what you value as a community. So that's that story of us piece, which is who are we? How do I know that we share values? What are the moments that we've experienced together that show us who we are? Mm -hmm. And then there's the story of now piece, which is what you're what you've just described, which is what are the issues that you really care about, right? What are the changes that you want to carry through? Is it around poverty? Is it around climate change? What are the things you really care about? But how do you talk about those in a story way and not in a statistics way, not in a vague way? But to take the issues you really care about and make them real, right? Assign a living, breathing community, human being to these abstract issues. Climate change really struggles with this because people feel like it's so far away. But actually, it's not. We're touched by it every single day. We've all had experiences in nature, in this world, where we, we, we feel this um, very deep connection to the land that we're inhabiting, right? How do you tell that as a story instead of saying by X date? Here's the doomsday situation, and here's why we have to make change. Well, tell me the story first. Help me to understand. Get my emotions involved, because then I'll be more motivated to act alongside you. And that's that story of now piece. And just to be clear, these are three different types of stories, right? The story of self, the story of us, and the story of now that we would use in different circumstances. Yes. In an ideal world, we can bring all three of those together at the same time to be able to bring action. So for example, if I'm in a room full of people and I believe that those people could be a real resource to help make change in an area I really care about, I'm going to start with the self. Here, here's who I am. I'm Sarah. Here are the moments I've experienced. Here's why I care. Here's who we are as a room, the moments we have experienced together that help me to see who we are and what we value. And now here's a challenge that we're all facing. Here's the story of why this matters. And here's now a call to action, a very concrete step that we can take together as a community to make that change, right? But like you're saying, all three of these stories can also have different applications in different moments. Like we were talking, uh, let's say with a colleague, you want to connect with them. You want to have a, a, a more meaningful relationship. You might just share a little bit about yourself, the story of self. Let's say you're in a meeting and you want to really bring up the morale. Let's say something very challenging has just gone down and you want people to find hope within one another. You might share a story of us. 
Let's say you're in a room where you have a, a really primed set of resources in that room to make a change. You might just share that story of now. What are we facing and what are we going to do about it? what's a, a concrete step we can take together to make that change? So yes, they can be definitely shared separately, but I think that this craft is the most powerful when you can bring all those elements together and bring people together around a change that you want to seek. For our listeners, a key is to think about these stories in advance. And I don't think it means that you have to be rehearsed or scripted or, and certainly not manipulative in how you use the stories. But yeah. as you're approaching a situation, whether it's a networking reception, some meeting uh, with a specified purpose, thinking to yourself, what stories will I have the opportunity to share? And, and when would those be helpful or appropriate? so that you're not stuck uh, standing there with nothing to say. Exactly right, Lori. I'm working with a really, really incredible woman right now who's doing just massive things in New York City right now. And when I'm working with her, she has so many different contexts where she'll need to bring out a self, an us, a now, all three of them. And so what we're, we're working on right now together is, well, how do we build a library of these very visual moments? right? Because let's say you're going to go on TV to be interviewed, or let's say you're going to be in a room full of donors, or let's say you're going to be in a room full of the community that's impacted. How can you actually tell these stories to mobilize in the moment without having to think too hard about it, right? These are things that you've prepared, that you've thought about. And as we build this library of, of very visual moments, she's able to bring them into these different contexts in these different rooms and really incorporate them with ease into the work that she's doing. I love that. Sarah, as we think about uh, coming to the end of our podcast, if you had to give our listeners one piece of advice as they're thinking about how to incorporate storytelling into their professional lives, what would you tell them? That's a good question. The, the most important thing is to come back to the heart. I think that the heart is the best indicator <laughs> Of, of most things in life. But I think specifically with story, listen to your heart as an indicator of what really matters to you. And when you think about how to bring story into your work and into your life and into the, the interactions that you have, think about where um, that heartbeat, those things that make your heart move a little bit quicker. How can you tell a story in that moment instead of just talking in abstraction about whatever it is that you're feeling in that moment? How can you bring story more um, effortlessly into your day-to-day -day interactions to build meaningful relationships? Because to me, when you can build meaningful relationships, that is the foundation of anything, any kind of action, strategy, work that you do in the world. I think it all starts with meaningful relationships. You can't get very far alone. We get much further when we're together. And so who's that together that you're building? right? Who are those relationships that you're building? And how can you tell these stories in a way that strengthen those relationships to then go and do beautiful things in this world? Sarah, thank you so much for spending time with us today and sharing the power of storytelling, sharing your personal stories and giving us some advice for how we can start to think about leveraging the power of stories in our own careers. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. This has been such a fun conversation. Sarah, it's been truly uplifting to hear how your childhood experiences have shaped your career story. You've taught countless leaders to use the power of their authentic stories to connect with their teams and drive change, and I am inspired by the potential that legal leaders have to do the same. We've covered a lot on today's episode, and if you want to know more about the Chief Legal Officer's role and many perspectives across legal leadership, visit us on Deloitte.com and search Chief Legal Officer. Want to hear from other legal leaders on this podcast? What can we bring you next? Please share your feedback. We really want to hear from you about topics and leaders of interest. Hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter to share your ideas. For more insights from many iconic and resilient leaders, just go to Deloitte.com backslash US backslash resilient. Until next time, stay safe and remain resilient.